article came across my desk that uh, was very interesting to me regarding the topic of uh, uh, so-called liberal scholarship and the relationship of liberal scholarship to conservatives. And it was written by Dan Wallace, who's a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, he talks about how he attended the, uh, an event of the Society of Biblical Literature, uh, which was uh, held in, in New Orleans. It was a three-day conference. And the staggering thing about this conference is, is that there were 10,000 people in attendance. And it's the, uh, the uh, Society of Biblical Literature is the largest society of biblical scholars on the planet. And some of the best noted evangelical scholars are there, in addition to that, there are uh, scholars from liberal persuasion. In fact, you, you, the case has been made that there are more liberal, unbelieving, uh, biblical scholars out there than there are evangelicals. Uh, Sixty to eighty uh, percent of he, uh, Wallace goes on to say says most biblical scholars are not Christians. I don't know the exact n numbers, but my guess is that between sixty and eighty percent of the members of SBL do not believe that Jesus' death paid for our sins or that he was bodily raised from the dead. Uh, so th this is a, a, a very interesting uh, group of, of scholars who do this on a yearly basis. I have a good friend, James Jordan, who goes uh, to the SBL every year. And uh, Wallace goes on to write, the annual SBL conference is a place where young scholars can present their papers, meet senior scholars, and talk to publishers about book projects. Master students meet with professors whom they'd like to study with for their PhDs. Now, the reason that this article is so interesting to me is a, a number of admissions that uh, Dr. Wallace makes regarding the, the shift that has taken place uh, among dispensational scholars, and especially at Dallas Theological Seminary. Dallas Theological Seminary is often touted as the bastion of dispensational scholarship, and it has been the bastion of dispensational scholarship of, a Sco, uh, the, of the Schofield variety and the uh, Lewis Berry Chafer uh, variety as well. But in the last 25 years, there has been a dramatic shift at Dallas Theological S Seminary, uh, of, of which many mainline dispensationalists, popular dispensationalists, have lamented. Uh, and I think this is an encouraging sign, but I wonder how many uh, dispensationalists out there who are in tune with the Left Behind series and the books written by Mark Hitchcock uh, and other uh, popular prophecy writers, I wonder if they really understand what's happened at Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, now, Dr. Wallace goes on to say, he says, one of my interns, a very bright student who is preparing for doctoral studies, met with one scholar to discuss the possibility of studying under him for his doctorate. And this is what the SBL is all about. You go there and you, uh, you meet with, with a number of professors at other institutions and hopefully you can get some uh, inroad into uh, possibly studying at the doc doctoral level. Anyway, this professor went on and encouraged this young man to pursue the doctorate at his non-confessional school in the United Kingdom. And um, he says, later, this young man met a world-class scholar of early Christian literature and engaged him in conversation. Uh, he demonstrated deep awareness of the professor's field, asking intelligent questions, and showing great interest in the subject. Then the professor asked him where he was earning his master's degree. Dallas Seminary was the response. The conversation immediately went south. And um, this is what uh, Dr. W uh, Wallace goes on to say. This was no isolated case. I've seen it happen time and time again. There is an assumption that students from an ev evangelical school, especially a dispensational school, only get a second class education and are blissfully ignorant of the historical critical issues of biblical scholarship. Now let me say something about Dallas Theological Seminary and its scholarship. There is no doubt that a student who goes through Dallas Seminary comes out of there very well equipped in the area of the languages, Greek and Hebrew. Some of the finest Greek and Hebrew scholars we have in the United States today come out of Dallas Theological Seminary. On the technical side of things, Dallas Seminary turns out a very good student. I know a number of students from Dallas Seminary. They're no longer dispensationalists, but they got a, they've got a, 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 a fine education at Dallas Seminary. And so 
My issue with dispensationalism has never been over the scholarship uh, uh, side of things. These guys do, in fact, know their Greek and their Hebrew very well. It's always been on their application of it, and I believe that uh, their scholarship is forced through a dispensational paradigm, which, by the way, is changing, has changed at Dallas Seminary. Uh, Wallace goes on to say, and Dallas Seminary students especially have a tough time getting into primo institute, institutes because of the stigma of coming from, yes, I'll say it again, a dispensational school. One of my interns uh, has, uh, was earning his second master's degree at a mainline school, even taking doctoral courses. He was head and shoulders above most of the doctoral students there, but when he applied for the Ph.D. at the same school, he was rejected. His Dallas Seminary degree eliminated him. Now, then what Dr. Wallace goes on to say this, yes, Dallas Seminary is a dispensational school, but it's not your father's dispensational school. Progressive dispensationalism, engineered by Daryl Bach, Craig Blazing, and others about 25 years ago, has tied a dispensational hermeneutic to more nuanced appreciation of the biblical covenants. And listen to this. Gone are the days of seeing two new covenants. Uh, though this is extremely important because dispensationalism has always made the case the Bible teach, teaches a distinction between Israel and the church, that there are two separate covenants, one for Israel and one for the church. That is the distinctive of dispensationalism. So much so that that's why uh, the, there, there's been the need for a, dispens, the, for a pre-tribulational rapture. So God could deal with the church independent of Israel, or in the in case of the pre-trib rapture, that actually to deal with Israel independent of the church. The church is taken off the earth and God, now the prophetic clock starts up again at the point of the rapture and then God deals with Israel during this the seven year period, three and a half years of which is devoted to the, to the great tribulation. So for Wallace to, to say this is, is, I'm encouraged by it. Uh, and, uh, and so in a, in a couple of the sessions I'm going to do on this show in subsequent days, I want to talk about uh, dispensationalists, uh, popular dispensationalists out there, haven't gotten the message that there has been a, a, a rift within the dispensational scholar, uh, scholarly community. Uh, Wallace goes on to say the differences between uh, other hermeneutical systems and the dispensationalism of today are not nearly as great as they used to be. Again, and it comes down to that distinction between Israel and the church, which has always been the heart of dispensational theology. And he goes on further, the great irony is that, that uh, so many liberal scholars don't even realize that Dallas Seminary has only one unit on dispensationalism, but it has never required its students to adhere to this, the, this system of interpretation. And so uh, Dr. Wallace has, has, has made a, a, a very startling admission uh, that I, I suspect a lot of uh, mainline, old line uh, dispensationalists are are not aware of, um, and I would I would like to see I would like to see some dialogue take place between progressive dispensationalists and a preterist like me. Now, Dr. Wallace has written on preterism. He has written more on the full preterist side. Uh, as far as I know, he really hasn't done any exposition dealing with the with the partial preterist view. Uh, which I think, of course, uh, has a lot to say to dispensation, dispensationalism and also has a lot to say to progressive dispensationalists because progressive dispensationalists really have not dealt very well with uh, pro partial preterist arguments. I would like to see a, a progressive dispensationalist take on some of the arguments uh, that have been raised by partial preterists, uh, say, on Matthew chapter 24. So I look forward to that taking place in the future. And the next few shows, I want to deal with a couple of arguments that I've received from people who are still trying to beat up on, on preterists from a from a uh, old line dispensational way, and how they are generally ignorant on basic uh, preterist arguments. So stay tuned and, and tune in in the next next two days.